Good evening. We just have another minute uh, or so till we begin. Sun is out today and it's been a beautiful day. It's getting a little bit warmer and than it was when we started this morning. So all right, I see we have about 12, 13 online. Let's go ahead and begin. The last several weeks, we've been looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and we're going to look and finalize that chapter tonight. As we look at the teaching on marriage, uh, there has been, uh, uh, I think there's seven questions that we have uh, been addressing. We have addressed five of those seven questions, and uh, this is uh, questions that the church in Corinth had for Paul, uh, remembering that we don't have the questions, but we have Paul's response to those. Uh, as we have dealt with the first five questions, it, it's not exactly easy as we dig through this. And tonight we're going to talk about some things that uh, are a little bit difficult as well. But we'll work through it and we will uh, hopefully glean from our study of the scripture tonight. Um, remember, as we're looking at this, as I, I think I just mentioned that, but I'll say it again. We have the answers, but we don't have the exact questions. So I may phrase it a few different ways just for us to understand. Uh, the question tonight that we are going to begin is, is question number six. Should a Christian father give their, their virgin daughter in marriage, or should a virgin get married? As we look at this question, we're going to first start off by reading verses 25 through 28. In 1 Corinthians 7, 25 through 28, it says, Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord, yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. I suppose, therefore, this is good because of the present distress, distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loo loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. As Paul transitions into this next question, he, he specifically addresses it to the virgins. Uh, uh, Paul, in have, handling this question, says, I have no commandment uh, from the Lord. It is, it is very like uh, verse 12, at the beginning of verse 12, where it said, I, not the Lord, says. And I explained this by saying that Jesus did not explicitly teach uh, on the subject, but Paul, being an ambassador uh, of Christ, will give the Lord's will on the matter. Now, verse 25, Paul is informing the reader again, but with a slight different twist in, 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 in how he says it. He says, yet I, I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. Uh, now, this reminds me of chapter 4, uh, verse 1 and 2, where it says, when Paul wrote, he said, Let a man so consider us, and that us is the apostles, uh, him included, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And moreover, it is required in the stewards that one be found faithful. And as we look at what Paul is saying here, that he he is is a trustworthy servant of God, and it should be, uh, as he's teaching, he reminds them that in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, that the only thing that really matters in his life, that he is a servant of Jesus Christ. And, and second, that he is found as a trustworthy uh, a steward of God's word. And, and as we look at what he's saying, uh, here, he said uh, that I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. Meaning you, this is from the Lord, meaning I'm a trustworthy steward of the teachings that I am going to give. 
on this. Now, verse 26 in chapter 7, he says, I suppose, therefore, uh, if we look at this, and it indicates Paul's judgment or opinion rests on the mercies given to him. It is a clear claim to be speaking uh, God's thoughts. He does not mean that he is not sure, where he says, I suppose, therefore, uh, meaning I, I'm not sure about this. Uh, no, that's not what he's saying at all. He's not even, he's, these are just, it's not that these are just his personal thoughts. He is saying this, and, and I like what uh, Reese has in his commentary on, on page 255, where he said uh, that Paul is saying, this is an excellent principle, a good fundamental rule in view of the present distress. Uh, and this present distress that we, we are looking at here, and uh, I looked at the uh, translation of this, what, what could these words be uh, translated as? Well, necessity, constraint, uh, compulsion, uh, or force, or violence. Uh, the, this all could be un underlying and translated in such a way uh, and a lot of the time, we can spend a lot of time speculating uh, on what Paul was referring to, but the fact is, we don't know uh, what, what, what was uh, taking place there. We don't know what the present distress is. We, we can, uh, like I said, speculate, but we don't know. And, and I'd rather spend our time looking at the things that we do know and what we can take from that. Uh, the church in Corinth may have addressed a circumstance. And, and this is Paul's response to this uh, present distress that he is responding to. And he said, it is good for a man to remain as he is. Now, as we look at this, we also need to understand this is, Paul seemed to be used to use a man as uh, encompassing both man and woman, uh, like how we do where we just say, well, a person, you know, we know that it's a man or a woman. Uh, and so sometimes he's specific with a man and, and the, or a husband and a wife, a man and a woman. I think sometimes as well, he's also just referring to as man in general as a person. Uh, so we need to look at verse, uh, as we look at this, he said that it is good for a man to remain as he is. I think he's what he's saying. It's, it's good for a person to remain as he is. Uh, verse 27 and 28 explain the current circle, current situations uh, that you might be in. Uh, you may be uh, 27. You may be bound to a wife. Uh, you may be uh, loose from a wife. Uh, what does he say here? Uh, if you're married, do not seek to be loose. Do not seek to be uh, pulled away from that marriage bond. Uh, if you are unmarried, do not seek a wife or a spouse. Uh, uh, it is good for a man to remain as he is. And what he's saying is, if you do marry, you have not sinned. If you, if virgins marry, they they have she has not sinned. Uh, when we look at this, is he's just explaining this uh, relation, the situation that you might find yourself in at this part. Who he's writing to, because he's writing to a group of people, a congregation. Uh, and there could be different circumstances, and he wanted to be inclusive in that. We, too, have the same situations. There could be some that are married, some that are unmarried. If there was distress going on in this world, uh, it, we may say, uh, remain as you as you are. Uh, it might, in Paul, I think that would be appropriate according to Scripture, and, and it may, be, uh, may come upon us, and we could talk as we talked about, there could be many dis, uh, uh, situations, distress that, that come about, especially maybe in time of war, time of uh, great turmoil, maybe great things like that that could mean that it'd be better for us not to marry, especially as Christians. Uh, now, we, he, he makes some uh, statement here, nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh. Now, I think it's important that this isn't a criticism of marriage, that, the, that marriage will give you uh, a great trouble in the flesh. Uh, no, he's not getting that. He, he said uh, he's getting to the, the, in context, the present distress that's going on 
Paul is using this as an encouragement to remain unmarried or to remain where you are. Nobody wants trouble. No, nobody wants to uh, uh, be in a situation where we have trouble in our flesh. I mean, we can look at that time right now with the whole pandemic. We don't want this in our life. They're, they're, but th what he's getting to here uh, is this encouragement could spare you some trouble in the flesh if you uh, would heed to it. And and uh, as we look further, we're going to push on to verse 29. He says, but this I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. Uh, Paul breaks into the application portion of his point. Uh, time is short. Uh, and no matter what situation that you are in or you find yourself in or where we're at in life, remember that time is valuable. Time is so valuable. I remember a coach in uh, junior high, and he, he, he often made comments, uh, especially when he heard uh, someone say, I wish uh, I was older. And, and he, he just it drove him crazy because he hated hearing kids wish uh, the, to be older. Uh, one of the things he said, you're going to wish that you're in high school. Then you're going to wish that you, you know, maybe that you're 16 so you can drive. Maybe you wish that you're 18 so you're out of high school and, uh, you know, and then you go to college or you can vote or you can do this. Uh, and, and he heard so often that these kids wishing away his life. And and one of the things I remember, well, he would yell at us and say, stop wishing away your life. Would you, would you just stop doing that? He said, live in the moment. Then take advantage of who you are and where you are, where you're at right now. Take advantage of the time that is right in, right in front of you, that is right where you are. And the time is short. Time is so precious. Before you know it, uh, you'll be at a such and such an age and you'll be wishing for that time back. And, and it doesn't matter. I, I say such and such an age because it could be 40, looking back to wishing I was 20 again. It could be 50, looking back to wanting to be 40. And it could be 80, wishing they were 60. You know, it, it, it's it, as we look at this, don't wish your life away. And second, remember how much valuable time is. And spiritually speaking, time is, is, is so valuable, so short. We see scriptures mentioning it over and over, how, how time is, it, it, how, how short life is. And, and we need to make sure that in this present time, in this present uh, uh, time that we're in, we need to make sure the relationship with God is in good standing. And the time is short, as Paul mentioned. Paul reminds the married, the married of this principle. Uh, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness is a scripture that we probably all know, Matthew 6, 33. And, and how uh, this principle of, of time is short is valuable for us to keep in mind what the major priorities are in our life that God must be first in our life. It is easy to get caught up in the day-to-day -day life, especially when it comes to marriage and having a family. You get caught up with that. And I, and I look, and having five children, I think it's, I, I look at each one of them, and I, I think to myself, how fast they've grown up. How, how, I don't even think I've been married this long. Well, that's, the, that's time. Time goes by quickly. Uh, we need to, Paul is reminding them how precious time is. Time is short. And, and, and we would be good as Christians to, one, not wish away our life, but one, take advantage of the time we have right now. But we see scriptures like today is the day of salvation. We need to make sure we're right with God in the present day so that uh, because time is short, we know that Jesus will come back at any point in time. He, he could. It, it, or something may happen to us physically. We may die. We need to make sure we're in good standing with the Lord. And time is short. But he said, so 
that from now on, even as those who have wives should be as though they have none. Now, uh, we know that he's not meaning that as we're living to neglect the wife or neglect the husband. That is not what he's teaching here. Uh, this is, we don't want to fail in our duties uh, of love and fidelity to our spouse. It, it means, though, that they should not neglect their service or relationship to God. Remember, early, earlier they, the, the, meaning the church in Corinth, thought that they should separate from their spouses because of their commitment to God. Paul, now Paul is teaching uh, against the opposite extreme. If we see this, uh, the, the extreme was to, to separate uh, from their spouse. Now he's teaching against the opposite, meaning don't go too far with this now. Uh, and and uh, fully devote every waking moment to your spouse. Uh, there's a balance that we have to have, a balance in life. We, we recognize that in all things. There has to be a balance. First, we put God first. We put God first. And, and, not, and second is our relationships, especially if you're married, relationship with your spouse, and maybe your kids and then the world. We know the first and greatest principle uh, commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your, your, your might. And as we think of that, that is what we should do. We should love God that way. Uh, and, and never forget that our, the, any relationship we find ourselves in, God has to be first. Don't go to the extreme other where we uh, go too far and forget our relationship with God. We don't want to do that. We have to always keep our relationship with God first and foremost. Let's go ahead and read verse 30 uh, through 32. Uh, those who weep as though they did not weep, those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, those who buy as though they did not possess, and those who use the world as not misusing it. For the form of this world is passing away, but I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, Now he, uh, the, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. Uh, we'll just stop right there for a second and, and talk about these as we and then push forward. Uh, the thought that is being expressed is this. Christians should be dead to the world and not improper, improperly affected by the, the passing events as, as life goes on. Uh, whenever we think of certain circumstances, he mentioned weeping, and we understand weeping to be sorrowful in most cases. There's a weeping of joy. I understand that. But in most cases, the, the weeping is sorrow. So when we look at when we are in this state of sorrow, how should we react? Well, time is short. Well, we're glad when we're in sorrow that time is short, but we need to then focus while we're in that state, and, and look to the eternal joy we have with God. Uh, we can also look at good times. We rejoice in good times, right? And, and that is important for us uh, to, to rejoice and be happy in these good times. But don't forget, time is short. Uh, look to the eternal happiness uh, that we will have with God. And as we see these circumstances, that uh, whether it's wealth or poverty, your earthly time is short. You can't take the things of this earth with you, whether the things that you buy uh, or the maybe things that you sell, the money that you get from that. Uh, you can't take these things with you. All of it, we understand and know, will be destroyed. Uh, uh, so uh, what should we do? Well, in our wealth and in our poverty, look forward to our eternal reward. Uh, and, and he goes on to say in verse 31, do not let the cares of this world get to you or affect your eternal destination. And that's, that's really uh, the point he's making in, in this kind of diverted away from the marriage. But he, he, he makes this point because in marriage, there could be sorrow. 
in marriage, there could be good times, and and then you could be rich or, or poverty. Think of our our marriage vows that we give in good times and bad, uh, and, and richer or for richer and poorer. Uh, you know, all these vows that we make; these are the common vows that uh, they you know that there could be different ones, but. We make these vows understanding that we're going to hold to no matter what situation happens, that we're going to hold to the marriage bond and we're going to be uh, love, have love and fidelity in that marriage. As we consider what he is getting to is do not let the cares of this world affect uh, your eternal destination. We don't want uh, the cares of the world to ruin our faith in God. Uh, he said, I want you to be without care. And when we think of what, what he's saying here, he's not talking about being immature uh, or, or being a point where, you know what, I don't care what's going on. No, he's not getting to that. But he wants us to know and not get caught up in the cares of this world in some ways. Uh, there, there are the cares of this world that needs addressed, uh, but let's not get to the point where we uh, affect our relationship with God. Verse, uh, or it's, I have this, uh, this statement is a result of verse 31 and 32, uh, when we see, do not worry so much that the cares of the world, uh, like stress and anxiety, depression, sleepless nights, and so on, could drag you down and hinder you as a Christian. Paul uh, uh, Paul made mention over and over how we are to put our trust in God. Ephesians chapter 6 in verse 10. No matter what situation we're going through, he said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. We need to be strong as Christians. And, and, and we're going to be put in different situations. We could be uh, in those uh, uh, stressful situations. We sh could have... Uh, times where we're a little anxious, so we could have times where we're depressed, so we could have times that we're struggling. Uh, there could be good times uh, where we're rejoicing, where everything seems to be going right. Whatever these things that we go through, don't forget about your relationship with God. It's so important. And remember, time is short. So we have to make sure that our relationship with God is right now and it is right every day. Uh, so we need to understand that sometimes in, in, in that whenever we go through these, just focus on something greater. Put your hope and trust in God. That he will provide. Put your hope and trust in him because he will help you and he loves you. Worldly things can and will distract you uh, with uh, with. Uh, from your Christian walk. Uh, worry about the things that matter, your relationship with God, and, and don't lose hope as we live in maybe even in uh, distressed times uh, that was mentioned. Uh, mostly, uh, we need to remember that it is important for us to stay focused on what really matters. Think of a child. Most times, a child is carefree, and, and they're content with whatever circumstance they are in. And mostly, I think it's because they have complete trust in their parents to take care of them. And, and hopefully, as parents, we're then saying, we have this, uh, we know that this will go, well, this will pass because we have a God that is great, and we have a God that we put our hope and trust in, and hopefully we relay that to our children and as we live our lives. Uh, we read uh, verse 33, uh, but let's go ahead and read verse 34. There is a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that he, she may be holy both in body and in spirit, but she who is um, married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. As we looked at verse 33 and 34, the married care about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord, how to please God. Uh, the married, that was the unmarried. I don't know if I said that right. The unmarried cares about the things of the Lord. 
The married cares about the things of this world, pleasing the spouse. One may think this is a plea uh, not to get married. Well, in some ways it is. Uh, it, this plea is not to lose focus on the important uh, relationship that matters as we, if we've been discussing through this whole section, that your relationship with God is first and foremost in your, should be first and foremost in your life. Verse 34, it, it should be noted that the word holy is not referring to the fact that the unmarried or virgins are more holy. Now, uh, I want us to look at this because as we just read it quickly, we may consider that. Well, it said, as it says, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. Uh, well, whenever we look at this, uh, we need to understand the context. The context uh, in here is uh, divided interest. Uh, uh, so we look at the holiness, uh, and then we see divided interest uh, as the, the contrast. So there's holy uh, in the opposite of that in the context of what's being brought up through the last uh, six to eight verses is divided interest. So when we look at holy, he's not referring to uh, not, not impure or, or sinful uh, it's divided interest is discussed throughout this whole chapter and it's distracting cares of marriage and the cares of this world could impact your relationship with God. So when we understand what holy means and what the opposite of holy means, we need to not have a false conclusion to say, see, the unmarried is more holy than those who get married. That is not what it's uh, getting at at all. We need to understand the context. Two important things that need to be remembered. God intended marriage to be the normal lot in life. The first two people that were that were created, uh, Adam and Eve, they got married. Uh, I mean, this is a normal thing. This is a normal uh, uh, part of life. Marriage is by no means incompatible with your service to God. See, if we remember those two facts, that God instituted marriage, and, and it's a normal thing, in in life, uh, uh, marriage is also uh, one that it's compatible to serve God. If it wasn't compatible, why did God uh, marry Adam and Eve? Why were they to be bound together in 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 Genesis chapter two, towards the end of the chapter? Then, well, uh, uh, you can see the obvious conclusion is that God uh, intended man and woman to be married. Now doesn't mean you have to be. doesn't mean you have to be married, though. we got, we got to be careful not to go to extremes. Well, like, well, being unmarried is holy, and that's the way I should be. Well, okay, that's good, but God intended for man and woman to have this uh, institution that we call marriage, and, and to, to have this uh, where there is benefits in marriage, where we understand that we have this uh, helpmate, and we also can then live uh, in, in harmony with God as we do so. So verse 35 that shows the motive behind what Paul is getting to at the, uh, as, as, as we discussed already. Uh, when we look at, uh, it says, your own prophet, what is best for you spiritually? Uh, rem with the reminder about God needs to be first in your life. Uh, uh, we see, but she he is who is married cares about those things. Uh, this is in verse 35. I'm sorry, not 34. And this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper that you may serve the Lord without distraction. Uh, uh, so we see what he's getting at. What is best for you spiritually? Re reminder to them that God needs to be first in your life. We'll serve God without distraction. Absolutely, we need to do that. Even though uh, we are married, we need to have uh, a, we need to keep that relationship working, but when we also need to serve the Lord. So we make an agreed upon time where we, we uh, uh, devote ourselves to God. And there's, I'm sure we all know that there's time that we waste, uh, whether it's sitting on our phones or sitting 
in, in, in just maybe, maybe just reading the news, uh, it's wasted time sometimes. But we, we look at this stuff. What about our service to God? There's time that we can make to serve God, and we need to make sure we're, we're making that, even if we're married or even if we're unmarried. Each of this we need to get and understand that it is important that we keep focus in our relationship with God. As we read uh, verse 36 through 38 of uh, should Christian fathers give their virgin daughters in marriage as as we get to this, uh, let me let me go ahead and read 36 through 38. But if any man thinks he is becoming Im, improperly toward his virgin, if she is past the flower of youth, and thus it must be, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin. Let them marry. Nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart having no necessity, but has power over his own will and has to, so determined in his heart that he will keep his virgin does well. So then he who gives her in marriage does well, but he who does not give her in marriage does better. As we look at this, and I, I read the question first, uh, so we kind of have that in mind as we were reading uh, it, should a Christian father give their virgin daughter in marriage? Well, yes, yes, is the direct answer. Uh, uh, and we may even say, well, uh, it is appropriate to say yes if in, uh, we'll, we'll get to the conclusion here in a second, but sometimes yes, sometimes no, but I think it, should Christian uh, fathers give their virgin daughters in marriage? I think that's appropriate, depending on the circumstance. And, and in times past, uh, in different cultures, and, and the father had a lot of input in who and when their daughters marry. Uh, the answer that Paul gives does not address any certain society way, societal ways of marriage uh, arrangements, but uses the direct issue of how a Christian father is to handle the marriage of his daughter. Um, now I'm going to say this: uh, I, as a father, as a father, I, I, I think um, I'm for arranged marriages. Uh, I'm definitely for it because uh, now I say that jokingly. Understand that uh, we have experience in life, uh, and we we can look and see those who are older, maybe those who have been married longer. We look at relationships and we say. I don't know if that's going to work. Well, being for arranged marriages, I can, you know, um, hopefully pick one that it will work. <laughs> so I say that jokingly, but but as we look at this, that's the way it was in in that time in that situation. The father had great input in his daughter's uh, husband. Um, as we look at this, uh, there was a, a phrase mentioned, the flower of youth. This is the physical maturity uh, of the daughter uh, for the married, marital relationship. Uh, and uh, so as we look, it, you wouldn't give a, a young daughter away, or at least you shouldn't, because they're not uh, physically mature uh, as we see this. So uh, uh, he, he gets to the point, give away as he wishes, he does not sin. In our society, I think it's safe to say, and, and sadly, it, it is sad to say that the marriage bond seems to be lacking the total commitment uh, of the husband and wife relationship. Uh, we see this and, and, and it's sad. But when we look at this, the, the getting married uh, is not just a, uh, oh, oh, we'll just do it on a whim. We shouldn't do that. We should take serious thought when we get married uh, and, and because it is for life uh, and we can't just go about it and say oh well, we'll try this and if it works that's great if it doesn't work well then oh well try again well we understand why that is wrong because of scripture because of the teachings of Christ and, and what God has revealed to us through his word that we can't have that attitude in the marriage bond 
it is important that we uh, marry uh, according to God's word and according to his will, according to what he uh, deems the relationship to be right. Now, God isn't going to just pick a spouse for us uh, and understand that. Uh, now, God may providentially, as we're praying to give uh, that we maybe we're praying for our daughters or praying for our sons that they would have a good Christian mate. Uh, he may work providentially, but he is not just picking one for us and saying, hope it works to you. And that's the way the father shouldn't be that way either. Uh, uh, so uh, the Christian father and even the mother have a deep concern uh, for their daughter or their son. As we look at this, uh, I think uh, a lot of it is looking more at the the, uh, the daughter as we look at this, but I think you can understand that a Christian father, a Christian mother, they want their child to marry someone that will help them with their relationship with God. Uh, and, and we have a great concern for who they married. And why is that? Well, one, that they're our child and they, we want them to be happy, but two, uh, uh, we care deeply for their soul. We want them to marry someone who is going to lead them to uh, to God and to help with leading that, to be a helper uh, in in making sure that uh, they, they're they held accountable to the things of of, of God and his, and his standard in which he has set forth. We want what is best for them in regard to their relationship with God. We want someone who is going to help them grow spiritually and encourage them and build them up in their faith. Uh, we often use the phrase, we want someone that will help them get to heaven. The Christian father in that time had control, control over allowing his daughter to marry. So uh, we see if he chooses to let them marry, he does not sin. So we look at should a, a father give their virgin daughters in marriage? Well, uh, it, yeah, he, he can. He can choose that. And he doesn't sin in doing that, even if there is present distress. But he also has the choice not to let them marry. As we read there, I think there's uh, four conditions that he, if he's uh, 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 going to choose that route. The, in verse uh, 38, uh, he said, if any man thinks he is behaving improperly toward his virgin, it, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, verse 37. Uh, 37 says, nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, and has so determined in his heart that he will keep his virgin, does well. So we look at these uh, four uh, circumstances and conditions if he's going to choose not to allow his daughter to marry. Uh, first of all, is he needs to have unwavering firmness. As we look at this, he needs to uh, stand steadfast in his heart uh, against societal pressures uh, of uh, you know, he's making this choice with the best interest in mind is his daughter. Uh, so there has to be unwavering uh, of this uh, uh, his in his heart that uh, he should not uh, have any societal pressures to to uh, sway his decision. We also need the the absence of constraint or no necessity is another way. Uh, of this. And, and this may be uh, the outward pressure, like uh, of whenever we, uh, in marriage, uh, or in this situation, at that time, you know, they would get, uh, uh, they would not sell off their daughter, but they would get a, a return, uh, uh, forget the term, I'm sorry, you probably have it in your mind, but you understand that they they would give their daughter a marriage and there would be an allotment back. It, not so much paying for it, and that's the only thing that's coming to my mind. But as, as we look at this and understand that the, there, should be, uh, there should be absence of constraint, meaning that they, there, there is nothing there. There's no outward pressure. Uh, and, and then he needs to, this other condition must be power over his own will. You see, there may be a reason why he doesn't want his daughter to marry. Maybe it's the help around the, 
the uh, the homestead. Maybe it's uh, this or that. But what he needs to do, though, is make sure he's seeking the best interest of his daughter, not over himself. Uh, and sometimes we can make decisions that will best interest for me and it wouldn't be for my daughter. Uh, and so we got to be careful with that. Uh, the next is a judgment in regard to uh, can she uh, not sin by being uh, uh, not married? As as we look at this uh, in verse 37, he says, uh, and has so determined in his heart that he will keep his virgin, does well. Uh, in, in meaning that she will not go and, and, and uh have problems with uh, fornication or those types of things if she remains in that, uh, that if he doesn't give her daughter a marriage. So th this is kind of a tough sec section in understanding this because really in our society today, oh, <laughs> sometimes the father really doesn't have too much of a say. Well, they may ask for your daughter's hand in marriage, but you know, what if you say no? I always think that's interesting. What if I say no? I would bet that maybe eight chances out of ten that they're going to get married anyways, uh, if they're seriously considering that. Um, as as we uh, look at this section, uh, I think it's kind of difficult because we we don't live in that type of society today. Uh, in, in these. It's, it's, the father doesn't usually have much say. Uh, he may have more say with his daughter to, here's some values that you should look for. Maybe here's some red flags you should stay away from. Uh, they may ask your opinion and such, but you don't have the uh, right in our society, as they think, uh, to say, no, you shouldn't marry them. No, you're not going to marry them, those types of things. So we have to be careful uh, understanding some of these are societal uh, issues and and how do we relate them to us is a little more difficult. Now, a, as we consider this, I like how Reese ends this section in his commentary. He said, when all was said, Paul leaves the problem of getting married to an open-ended question to be settled on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and that's important because the, the should, should a daughter, a virgin get married? Should a, a father give them away? Well, it depends on the certain circumstances, and, and uh, I think we've addressed that uh, pretty well tonight. Uh, the next question, and we'll deal with this in uh, hopefully uh, in a few minutes here. Uh, uh, may a Christian widow remarry? Let's read verses 39 through 40. A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives, but if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. But she is happier if she remains as she is, according to my judgment, and I think I also have the Spirit of God. As we consider this next question, I want to first review in the situations necessary for one to marry or those who are eligible to to marry in in God's eyes, or or we may look in view of Scripture. So, uh, who is eligible for marriage? One who has never been married. Uh, two, one who is divorced because their spouse cheated on them, or had a sexual there was sexual immorality in the marriage. the The one who didn't do that uh, is free to marry. Uh, and one who is married but the spouse dies. Those who are eligible for uh, being married uh, a second time. Uh, so as we look at this, in, in, in view of Scripture, in view of God's uh, uh, teachings on, through the Scripture, we know those are people who are eligible to marry. Now, let's also get to the opposite. Who is not eligible for marriage in God's eyes? Someone who is already married. You can't, if you're already married, you can't go out and seek someone else to marry. That's not, you're not eligible. So if you're already married, you're not eligible to get married to somebody else. Uh, and who, who is also not eligible? One who is divorced and it be for something 
other than sexual immorality. Meaning, uh, if you just get divorced because things didn't work out, you're not eligible to remarry. Uh, and we see that that is not my opinion. That's what the scripture teaches. Uh, so we look at the marriage bond and how it is sacred. And, and it's a special bond that God ordained for us. And, and I, as often as we uh, hear the marriage vows, till death do us part, we offer our fidelity as long as we live our marriage vows. When the fidelity is broken, only uh, the one who can be scripturally remarried uh, is the innocent spouse. The other ending point to a marriage is death, death of a spouse. That ends the marriage. Here it, it's, uh, the marriage bond is then ended. So Paul here clearly addresses that the marriage ends at the death of a spouse. The remaining spouse is now at liberty to be married again to whomever they choose. If, if Paul stopped there, if, that would be very clear, and nobody would have any issue. But he adds uh, four words, only in the Lord. Uh, and we're going to talk about that for our remaining time. With, that, with adding that statement, there is now some limitations uh, one has in marrying again. So what does that mean, and how should this be addressed? Well, in context, let's think of the context of, uh, of chapter 7, and it might help us as we go through this. Uh, we may just think it's just about marriage, chapter 7, in some ways it is. But we already examined, even tonight, that our relationship with God takes precedent over any relationship we have in our life. Our devotion to the Lord must be unwavering in any situation that we are in. If, if the spouses, it, it, let's put uh, forth some situations that we've discussed. If the spouses are both Christians, uh, uh, their devotion needs to first be to the Lord, first to the Lord. I, I think uh, me and my wife do well. We teach our kids uh, that we love God more than we love our spouse. And they know that, and we want them to understand that they should love God more than their mommy and their daddy. And so we we try to teach that Christian principle because that's what God wants us to have in our relationship, in our devotion to Him, in our service to Him. So if one is, if one finds himself in where their spouse is 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 not a Christian, what is their most important priority? their devotion to the Lord, their, their life and their service to the Lord is first and foremost. Uh, if they're married uh, uh, and their spouse is not a Christian, their, their main focus should be on the Lord. Uh, or if one is separated or divorced, um, their devotion still needs to be first to the Lord. If one is widowed, their devotion must be first to the Lord. Uh, we get this over and over again throughout the context of chapter 7. If one wants to be married again because of the death of a spouse, what is our first priority? Making sure that our relationship with God is first and foremost uh, in our life. Uh, now, we look at this and understand this, that there is no earthly relationship that is more important than your relationship with God. Another way to say it, there's no worldly uh, relationship is to impact your relationship to God. So as we consider this only in the Lord, it is a direct command of the widow who is consider, considering marriage again. There is no instruction or further guidance by this statement. So what does it mean? Well, there's two views on, on what it means, and, and I'll give you both of them. Um, I probably lean stronger to the one than the other. Uh, marrying someone who uh, meets the Lord's standards is eligible to marry. And so we look at the widow, and we see that uh, the situations that as we looked at who is eligible to marry, uh, making sure that they're in the Lord's uh, 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 the Lord's standards for for uh, marriage again. Uh, oh, that that is the view of what only in the Lord means. And the other one is uh, the other view on what this means is Christians can only marry Christians. 
Uh, and I think that's uh, pretty clear, uh, clear on how we should uh, uh, look at those two points there. My recommendation is this. If you are a Christian and you're in the body of Christ, my recommendation is that you only marry uh, someone who is the same. Uh, we, why put yourself in any situation uh, that was addressed the, before, like marriage, uh, to a non-believer? Why, why put yourself in that situation? Marry someone that's in uh, that that has the exact same values as you. And there is nothing. Uh, I, there, there is great value in marrying and being married to a Christian. Uh, and it's, I think it would be my recommendation that that's the way I would follow. Uh, and um, I probably lean towards that uh, view of this more than the other. Uh, but uh, we can definitely think about those things in serious thought. Uh, if you're going to marry again, I would seriously consider uh, how you approach that, meaning this. You need to keep your relationship with God first in your life. You need to make sure that the, the one you are marrying is going to help you uh, in your relationship with God, not hinder you. I think that's a valuable advice for someone who is not married, whether they're widowed or whether they're young. I think uh, they need to seriously consider how, who they marry in their relationship with God and how that is impacted by that. Um, as we press on here, verse 40 uh, concludes the thoughts as Paul's judgment would be that she would be happier if she remained as she is. Now, um, we, I think we've discussed this uh, through Paul making uh, comments like these, uh, happier, I think is in it, this is what I found was very interesting, it is the same uh, Greek word that was used in the Beatitudes, often translated uh, blessed. Uh, so we look at the, why would he say that they would be happier? Well, uh, maybe it's because he's in that current situation. Maybe the, the present distress is going on and it'd be easier to have your service devotion to God. But Paul ended this section with the acknowledgement that he has the Spirit of God. Well, he is writing through inspiration, that he is not just offering his opinions through this, but he is one who has inspiration, that he is inspired, and we know that the, all Scripture is inspired by God, breathed out by God, and is for us, to help us in our Christian life. I'd like to close tonight by... Uh, I think uh, addressing this quick point, your relationship with God. We look at the relationships of God, our, our relationship with God, and that's the most important thing that we uh, can do in our life is to be right with God. We're here to help you with that if we can. We can, if you're willing to talk with us, and uh, we would love to show you what God's Word says and make sure that you're in the right relationship with God whether that's becoming a Christian or turning back to God, repenting of sin, uh, we would, uh, we're here for you to help you with that. And as we close today, uh, let, let's go ahead and pray and then we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us your word. Father, we're so thankful that we have this understanding of, of, of marriage and the proper relationships that we have have in, in this world. Help us to, first and foremost, be faithful to you, that we would uh, be uh, put you first in our life, and that we would strive to be pleasing to you in all ways. Father, help us in our life, in the circumstances we find ourselves in. Please give us strength, please give us wisdom and guidance, and, and help as we do so, and help us to do what's right according to your will. Father, we, we know that there are many sick, and each one of us knows uh, uh, some that, that, that just uh, are not doing well. Father, if it's your will, we pray that you would give them the strength and comfort they need at this time. And Father, if it's your will, we pray that you would heal them. 
Father, be with us as we go about this week. Help us and help us to grow closer to you. Help us to be the servants of, that you require of us. Help us to, to be a light to this world and that we could spread your word throughout this whole world and that all could come before you and, and be right with you. Thank you so much for Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining in tonight. Uh, we will have another live stream session at seven o'clock on Wednesday night. Uh, Andy will have the kids class uh, followed by the adult study at 7.15. Uh, have a great week and God bless.